Estonia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, and Romania. And then they said, oh, come on, what do you stop? Then in 2007, Putin said, okay, you've done it. You keep expanding NATO. You promised you wouldn't, but you keep doing it. Stop. Do not come up to our border with Ukraine and Georgia. And by the way, people should take a map out and understand a little bit about this. The real goal of these neocons, the Newland neocons, is to surround Russia in the Black Sea. This is why, where does Georgia come in here? I don't mean Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, Georgia's the country in the Caucasus. Where does that come from? If you look at a map, the idea of these neocons is that you have Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia surrounding Russia in the Black Sea. And Putin saying, don't do this, stop. And he says this in 2007. Then in 2008, Bush pushes this and Newland is key member of the administration then. And they push this over the opposition of the Europeans and get the Bucharest NATO declaration to declare that Ukraine will be a member of NATO, will. And by the way, Biden has been part of this all along. And the military industrial complex has pushed this. The, lo the literal lobbies for NATO enlargement have been Raytheon people. I mean, you can't make this up. This is how the U.S. government works. Lastly, Raytheon. Jeffrey Sachs, yes. I want to ask you about Ukraine and the future of Ukraine. Should we continue on this uh, calamitous path of endless war, uh, funding the propping up the Ukrainian government to the tune of $6 billion a month, spending over $115 billion to continue the war, half of that going to military contractors for weapons and, and military training. Uh, meanwhile, uh, what's going to happen to the Ukrainian economy? Because we've already read about Zelensky privatizing a lot of these industries that were nationalized under the Soviet Union. And we know that BlackRock, representatives of BlackRock have been over in Ukraine. And we know that Zelensky has a website. And on the website, there's a menu for privatizing Ukraine and, and inviting investors to, yes, invest in the military in Ukraine. Where do you see this going? Should we continue on this course? Look, Ukraine is being destroyed. This is the first tragedy is for Ukraine itself. <clears throat> being a place where the U.S. wages a proxy war is the worst place you can be. As, as Kissinger famously said, you know, to be an enemy of the United States uh, is dangerous, but to be a friend can be fatal. We are killing Ukraine. Literally, we're killing Ukrainians, but we're killing Ukraine. Think of how we loved Afghanistan how we love South Vietnam. What do we do, Iraq? If, you're, if you are the place where the US is waging a proxy war, first of all, you will be physically destroyed. You will have mass out migration of young people, of talented people, of people just trying to survive for God's sake. You'll have your infrastructure destroyed. All of this, the, the Ukrainian economy is busted and the, the Ukrainian population has shrunk tremendously because people have left the country. And so this is no way helping Ukraine. This is just, I tried to tell the Ukrainians, I'm, I'm for you, I'm not against you. This is, they kept thinking, oh, that's Putin propaganda. I said, no, listen. I go back to the Vietnam War in the United States, to Iraq, Afghanistan. I've seen what happens when the U.S. grabs you in a proxy war. And this is what's happening right now to Ukraine. It's being tragically destroyed. And every time things don't work, our side ratchets up and they keep ratcheting up and sad to say you know obama knew in 2014 he he got the main point when he said and realized that russia has what's called escalatory dominance 
what that means is Russia can meet us and raise the bet. Because for Russia, this is existential. For us, it's another war. Okay, we're going to expand NATO here. We're going to expand NATO there. We're going to do whatever we want to do. For Russia, they view this as the essence of Russia's national security. They have 1,600 deployed nuclear weapons. Obama realized this, said, I don't want to even start down this path. I don't know what this administration is doing. They have no plan. It's all, it's phony. It, and phony in the sense that they have no route to success, but they're in it up to their necks right now. Worse than that, for Ukraine, they're in it above their heads. They're drowning in this violence. We've got to stop the fighting because there is no military path to victory because Russia can escalate and can escalate to devastation. And we keep and we were told, oh, don't say that. Don't 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 mention nuclear weapons and so forth. <clears throat> you know what? Mention them. Understand. Yes. And I think understand we should also, this. I think we should also mention, Jeffrey Sachs, that the United States says in nuclear posture review, the Biden administration says we will use nuclear weapons first if our allies' interests are threatened. So, you know, who's going to use them first or will they be used? All of this is speculation, but it's frightening that we are escalating right now, training Ukrainians on F-16 fighter jets that could... Uh, After they said again Russia. and again that they wouldn't do it, they keep right. taking the next step. It's time for the Newland administration really to step down so that we can have peace and have some sanity. And the world is diminished. There's no doubt that China is a, another option for countries. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, most uh, of the developing world does not want a US-led hegemony anyway, but it was living with one, or at least with the US intention of one. And the rise of China changes this uh, fundamentally uh, because now the balance of power is much more uh, dispersed. Uh, the BRICS countries have an output when measured in purchasing power prices that is even slightly larger than the G7 right now. Of course, the BRICs have many more people than the G7, so the per capita income in the G7 is much higher. But just the BRICs is a, a larger block, around 32% of world output compared to 31% of world output of the G7. US-China tensions have been rising since 2014 and my view is that the U.S. security state already uh, around 2015 began to uh, push for measures to, in the American mindset, contain China. Uh, I think uh, there was a change of mindset around that time in the American political and security leadership that said China's continued rise is no longer in America's interest. And uh, a series of measures have been implemented since 2015 that really aim to hinder China's economy and according to the US, hinder China's military capacity. But I think it's more general than that. And those measures include, of course, trying to establish a trans-Pacific partnership that would exclude China, rather extraordinary in my mind, almost laughable to make a, an, a Pacific Basin trading system designed to exclude China as if somehow the Chinese economy wasn't there and the 1.4 billion people of China were not there. Of course, the US is constructing new alliances like AUKUS, uh, the uh, Australia, UK, US, uh, grouping to uh, base uh, nuclear submarines in Australia, ostensibly to police uh, the South China Sea. Uh, the U.S. has imposed technology barriers on China, financial barriers on China. Uh, the U.S. has uh, targeted leading Chinese enterprises like Huawei 
and ZTE. Uh, the U.S. is going after TikTok, uh, and uh, now it's going after the cloud services of uh, Alibaba <coughs> and uh, other major tech companies in China. So why is it doing this? In my view, it is uh, mainly a misguided uh, and a dangerous approach uh, to try to maintain U.S. predominance over China. Uh, I think that it is both wrongly directed and almost sure to fail uh, because China is very successful society and successful economy with a lot of dynamism, with a lot of scientific and research capacity, with a lot of friends around the world. And the, U the U.S. idea of dominance is not very attractive to most of the world. Most of the world would like good relations with the U.S., but not a U.S. that is dominant. I don't know of countries that are willing to make sacrifices for U.S. dominance other than uh, the close U.S. allies. So when it comes to certainly Chile or Mercosur, Latin America more generally, or UNISUR, the goal for sure is to keep good, open trade relations and financial relations and technology relations with China and to aim to do the same with the United States and with Europe. I don't think that there is any remotely sensible policy other than the South American countries saying, of course, we trade with China normally. Of course, we're partners with China, but we're also partners with the US and Europe. And we see absolutely no reason to choose sides. And we don't want to be pushed to choose sides. I personally see nothing nefarious in any of China's initiatives, whether it's the Belt and Road Initiative or others. And I don't believe the Western press, which I regard as mostly propaganda, that the Belt and Road Initiative is a debt trap or Chinese companies are especially harmful to uh, host countries and so forth. So I don't view this as a complicated question, actually, in its substance. I, I see the U.S. changed its attitude. And when I say the U.S., I mean the security establishment, uh, which runs the U.S. government foreign policy, changed its attitude to China eight years ago. I do not believe that China provoked that. I don't think it was in response to hostile action from China. I think it was in response to China's success rather than to hostility from China. So I would encourage Chile and Latin America to keep open trade. Every day I say in the United States, maintain relations with China, stop trying to provoke a conflict over Taiwan, stop sending arms to Taiwan. Don't do in Taiwan what we did in Ukraine, which was to create the provocations that led to war, because I also believe that the Ukraine war was caused by U.S. provocations, not by Russian uh, imperial design. Of course, most American leaders violently disagree with me, or maybe not violently, but uh, uh, strongly disagree with me. But I'm old enough that I understand them at this point after almost 50 years of watching U.S. foreign policy, and I think they're wrong and I think they're provocative. And I don't want them to do the same thing in Taiwan that they've done in Ukraine, uh, which is pump in a lot of arms and then express surprise when a war starts. Uh, but that's a possibility that would be a terrible possibility. I believe the U.S. sanction regimes in general are illegal. Uh, I do not uh, abide by unilateral coercive measures. My understanding of international law, as reflected in annual votes by the U.N. General Assembly, is that such sanctions policies are uh, not valid unless adopted by the U.N. So I would hope that 
Latin America would not get trapped in sanctions regimes, but basically would also take the position that nobody can sanction Chile's trade with China. And by the way, Chile's trade with Russia or others, though it's not as important, um, because uh, if there are to be such sanctions, they're only valid if they're undertaken under the UN Charter, essentially by the UN Security Council. So that's my general view. Uh, and my general belief is that trade between South America and China should be strong. And I think it will be mutually beneficial. Uh, Latin America, of course, has a resource base, which is very complementary to China's. Uh, China likes wonderful wine, uh, great fruits, uh, minerals, many uh, wonderful things that Chile uh, specializes in producing. Uh, it needs those things. Uh, and um, I think that uh, it will trade and uh, help uh, enrich Chile doing so. Uh, at the same time, uh, China has some excellent low cost infrastructure technologies that I think can be a very great benefit for South America uh, in terms of rolling out 5G, in terms of uh, an integrated zero carbon power system. China is very good at long distance uh, uh, direct current high voltage transmission uh, to build a, an integrated South America wide zero carbon power system, which Chile could be a very important uh, energy provider uh, to such a system. And so I see many complementarities that are very strong and hope that uh, Latin America's and South America's uh, uh, trade, finance, diplomatic uh, relations with China remain uh, strong and, uh, and dynamic. Maybe I'll just stop at that point has been raised by the New York Times in its editorials, in its opinion, columns of the New York Times columnists like Tom Friedman and others, and in the invited op-eds. And you just can't get a word in. Otherwise, you can't tell that readership you were just describing in Manhattan, where I happen to live, what's really going on. So th this is the frightening part. And we're also told, Glenn, which is pretty damn weird. Don't worry about nuclear escalation. Don't be blackmailed by this. My advice is worry and worry a lot. And if you have uh, been around these issues for a while, and I have for decades, and I wrote a book about the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis and Kennedy's uh, successful quest to negotiate a partial nuclear test ban treaty with Nikita Khrushchev, you know, if you're not worried, you just don't get it because you better be worried. And I'm very worried about this administration not getting it. You know, it's, it was such a staple of Cold War culture, Cold War policy, that avoiding nuclear war was the single greatest priority as we were going around the world with these proxy conflicts against the Soviet Union. We managed never to directly engage them militarily. And even then, misperception, miscommunication did bring the world close to nuclear annihilation, at least on two occasions between the Soviet Union and the United States. And yet it really does amaze me that we seem to have just kind of through, I don't know, inertia or lethargy or historical ignorance come to view the risk of nuclear war as basically a fiction, as kind of assigning zero value to it, or even this kind of macho attitude that we're not going to be deterred by the country, a country having nuclear weapons. Talk a little bit about you know, in the time that you've been working in all the things that I discussed in these kind of geopolitical uh, framework, even from an economics perspective, the specter of nuclear war and how it used to be kind of important for people and policymakers in deciding what they would and wouldn't do. You know, there was one moment when uh, Biden was caught on tape saying, uh, you know, we're on a path to Armageddon. Uh, this is, uh, I think it was the fall of uh, 2022. 2021, if I remember. No, 2022. 2022. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, 2022, excuse me. Uh, and you know, he was excoriated by the press the next day, <laughs> rather than anybody reflecting, oh my God, 
the president of the United States is saying this. He was excoriated. How dare he say this? You know, he let a tiny glimmer of the truth in. And then, of course, the whole idea was shut that up. Don't talk about that. Well, anyone that knows some history, and by the way, if you want to know some history, the most wonderful book written about this by a great historian is a book called Gambling with Armageddon by a late great historian, Martin Sherwin, who wrote about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the whole atomic age, in fact. And the book is terrifying because we came so close 60 years ago, uh, actually 61 years ago now, to nuclear annihilation. And almost every one of Kennedy's aides would have pushed us to that. We fortunately had uh, a president who uh, had the sense uh, to avoid uh, the ultimate disaster, but almost none of his aides had that sense. And what Sherwin recalls and what we've learned from Dan Ellsberg and from so many others is how close we've come and how easy it is to come close because there's so many stupid people in our government. Believe me, this is something I can tell you. Absolutely. People who don't think, who are extraordinarily lacking in basic common sense, who believe that power is the only coin of the realm, uh, who uh, believe you really do have to be tough on whatever it is, and nuclear war will see them down. And uh, all of this is uh, extraordinarily reckless, and we're really in it now. And it's, of course, not just Ukraine. It's Nancy Pelosi flying to Taiwan. Uh, it's uh, us doing whatever we can to humiliate China. It's having an absurd G7 meeting last week in Hiroshima, of all place, places uh, that the U.S., of course, uh, bombed with the first nuclear uh, atomic bomb. Uh, spending the whole G7 in essence to attack China and Russia. They, they think it maybe they think it plays politics. They think it's a game. It's extraordinarily reckless and extraordinarily dangerous and extraordinarily predictable what's going on. Yeah. Because the the, the real diplomats inside the U.S. have been warning about this for decades. We're only finding some of it out by WikiLeaks and by, uh, by disclosures such as uh, Bill Burns, their CIA director, who was in 2008 the U.S. ambassador to Russia. And he sent a memo that everybody should read. For Condoleezza Rice. 2008, yeah, he explained, my God, this NATO enlargement business is absolutely dangerous. And of course, George Kennan, a decade earlier, and George Kennan was absolutely brilliant and understood already in the 50s how we could have gotten out of the Cold War. But certainly in 1997, he wrote an op-ed in, in the New York Times when they still ran such op-eds, uh, <laughs> that uh, this whole NATO enlargement business was absolutely reckless. And what's interesting, when Kennan was writing that in 1997, I hadn't actually realized it until I went back and saw a reference to uh, an article in Foreign Affairs by Zvig Brzezinski that I didn't remember, writing in 1997, laying out almost the precise timetable for how we were going to incorporate Ukraine into NATO. Now, this is years before Putin's president. This is when we're not having any uh, war with Russia. People tell me, oh, yeah, well, they have to be in NATO. Look at Putin, uh, you know, madman. But this is well before, and Brzezinski lays out basically to the year the sequence of how it's going to be the first uh, row of countries, which was Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, then it's going to be the next row, then Ukraine by 2005 to 2010, he writes, they're going to have their invitation. It turned out to be 2008. Our ambassador to NATO in 2008 was none other than Victoria Nuland, 
If you want to know what deep state means, she's been in every administration. She's been almost every night. Except Trump. when Trump but was elected. Was, That's the only big exactly. way apparently to get her out of the government. <laughs> Except Trump. Yeah. So she was Cheney's advisor. She was ambassador to NATO when we asked Ukraine to come in. She was the point person on the U.S. engagement in the violent overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych in February 2014, which started the war in Ukraine. And she is now promoted for all of this, uh, bringing us ever closer to disaster. And by the way, putting Ukraine in the classic place in a proxy war guaranteed to destroy that country, which is exactly what it's doing. You know, the thing that struck me so much about that Bill Burns memo in 2008 when he was warning Condoleezza Rice and others in the Bush administration about the insanity of this plan was he said, it isn't just Putin. You go and talk to every single person of influence in Moscow, even Putin's liberal critics, and it's all, for every last one of them, a huge red line to be mucking around in Ukraine for the West, in part because of the history of the 20th century. And that's what I wanted to ask you. You gave this interview in February of 2023 with Isaac Chadner of The New Yorker, who has been kind of come this hero to the liberal establishment because of these adversarial interviews he purportedly does. A lot of it is based on how transcripts get edited, how much he gets to say, how much the guest gets to say. I've done a couple of those with him, so I know firsthand. Um, one of the points what a, low life what a low life approach to journalism. Uh, uh, completely, completely. I mean, it, 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 I mean, I, my, my night failed ended up being pretty fair, but I've seen him done incredible hatchet jobs with others, including yours, because one of the points you kept trying to make was that the premises of his questions embedded in them, they were almost like, when did you stop beating your wife questions, were so misguided because he was distorting the history of the conflict in part by thinking the war began either in 2022 or even in 2014 with Crimea, and you kept pointing it out, actually, the start of the war is 2013 with this change of government that he was shocked you called a coup, or even before with NATO expansion, even before it got to Ukraine. So talk about those parts of the history that the New York Times, the New York, the New Yorker editors didn't allow you to have included in that article and why you think that history is so important to understanding how we're being propagandized about the conflict now. Well, it's, it's a, a little amazing to be the New Yorker of all places. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say of all places, but Remnick's New Yorker is, uh, is absolutely neocon beginning to end. The New York Times is uh, completely neocon. I don't know if they would be, by the way, if I can't figure it out if it's just anti-Trump, pro-Biden, or they really believe the stuff that they say, but they're absolutely unwilling to listen or to learn a fact. The thing that surprised me about Chotner was just how he knew nothing and kept making aggressive assertions. And when you tried to say something, it was just snark. So it was a really weird <laughs> Weird well, he's playing to that Not audience that, that loves it. Like, you know, they assume all of his assumptions that he's getting from the New York Times. That's the full extent of their worldview. You kept trying to inject an alternative historical understanding, but it never made it into the article, which is why I'd love for you to offer it now about the importance of 2013 and that change of government. And even kind of going back to when NATO started expanding after the reunification of Germany eastward toward the Soviet or toward Russia. Well, you know, I, I posted a piece on common dreams, which people can take a look at to get a lot of the hyperlinks and a lot of the underlying data and evidence. But this story really goes back 34 years. Uh, it goes back to 1989, 1990. Uh, the U.S. was and Germany were both very clear to Gorbachev, who was a godsend for the world, by the way because he really was a man of peace. And I was profoundly honored to try to help uh, him uh, in, on the economic side, though the White House was having none of it at the time. But in any event, Gorbachev believed in peace and he unilaterally disbanded the Warsaw Pact, which was the, the Soviet side, NATO. And uh, uh, Baker, uh, and uh, Hans Dietrich Genscher, the German foreign minister, repeated <laughs> time and again 
to Gorbachev and in many, many different forms, and so did the NATO Secretary General and others, we will not move NATO one inch eastward. We won't do it. Now, I spoke to a wonderful historian uh, who is working on this right now, who tells me that in the archives he's come across in 1992, not only the plans for NATO expansion, but Ukraine already on the list for NATO expansion in 1992, when supposedly in the public, there is no such thing as NATO expansion at all. But remember 1992, that was Cheney, Wolfowitz uh, and Rumsfeld in, in, uh, in, the, in the Bush senior administration. I thought, what could be worse? Well, we kept learning. <laughs> Things can get worse. <laughs> right, right. Uh, even, 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 and, and, and in the Democratic Party, the the, the 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 love affair with the so-called liberal hegemony, I don't know what the liberal part is, but I know what the hegemony part is, uh, that has been Newland's uh, thing, and of course her husband, uh, Robert Kagan's thing uh, for decades. This has been underway since the early 1990s. Now, the Russians have been saying, and Gorbachev said, don't move eastward. We want peace. We want openness. I was actually advisor to Gorbachev. I was economic advisor to Yeltsin. I was economic advisor to Leonid Kuchma, first president of independent Ukraine. I've seen all of these people. You know what they wanted? They wanted normal life. They wanted to stop the Cold War. They did not want crazy things. They wanted normalcy. And we wouldn't give it what we said. Normalcy, yeah, that's U.S. hegemony. That's U.S. indispensable power. That's U.S. we do what we want anywhere we want when we want it. And that has been the story all along. And frankly, I couldn't imagine it at the time because I was watching with my own eyes as a young guy. Suddenly, the world had a chance for peace. And peace didn't mean U.S. global hegemony, peace meant normal cooperation, but we couldn't accept the deal of just being normal and cooperative. We had to say, now we lead on everything. And that's been the story since the beginning. Now, there are many steps to it. Uh, Clinton was the, the first violator of the, the, the promises, and Clinton's so inconsistent on everything, but this is one of the things he was inconsistent on. Uh, so the first NATO expansion took place under Clinton, uh, and uh, that was uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic. The next NATO expansion, seven countries by Bush Jr. in 2004, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Romania and Bulgaria on the Black Sea. So you had the Baltic states, you had Romania and Bulgaria. You're starting to, you know, right up against Russia, uh, Slovakia and Slovenia. Now, Putin says in 2007, stop already, stop. He says it in a famous speech uh, at the Munich Security Conference in 2007. We don't listen at all. 2008, Bush says NATO is going to enlarge to Ukraine. The European leaders, by the way, were aghast. And the, one of the European top leaders at the time called me, said, what is your president doing? Of course, European leaders don't say any of this publicly, but they say privately, this is crazy. This is so dangerous. But of course, they were quiet. Bush pushed this through in 2008. Then there was a reprieve for Ukraine. The reprieve was that the president, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, said, look, we're in between two giants. We don't want to be smashed in the middle. We take neutrality. But neutrality was a red flag for Victoria Newland and, uh, and her friends. And so at the end of 2013, when demonstrations against the decision that Yanukovych had made to postpone signing an agreement with EU started protests. Believe me, the U.S. covertly and overtly and every other way stirred that up massively. But in January and February 2014, they supported a violent insurrection 
that overthrew Yanukovych. And of course, notoriously, Newland was caught on tape, something we don't talk about, but anyone go listen she to it. She picked the she's, next leader. She picked the new leader. She, she She's planning the government weeks before the overthrow, calling exactly who would be the prime minister, by the way. It's amazing. But the whole thing is amnesia. Don't talk about any of this, so though it's so obvious. And I had a weird experience personally, which was that when the government was overthrown and Yanukovych fled and Yatsenuk was prime minister, just as uh, Newland said, I got a call. Yatsenuk wants to meet you. It's a deep economic crisis. Okay, you know, I actually respond to those things when a government says we're in a very deep financial crisis. So I flew to Kiev and I, I had an NGO brag to me about the role they played in the overthrow. And it was ugly. It left me shaking as, you know, the kind of thing you just want to wash that off. Don't tell me this awful stuff. You had no business being part of a violent insurrection. But that's the role we played. I went home. I did go back. I was disgusted by the whole thing. But it was obvious then we were on a path towards war. This didn't start with a, quote, unprovoked invasion February 24th, 2022, 21, sorry. Uh, no, 22, excuse me. Uh, this started in February 2014. And it started with the U.S. participation in a coup. A political outcome right now, not the one we wanted, but we were so dumb not to take a better deal a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, that now we're in a situation where we're not going to get exactly what we, quote, want. But to continue the fighting would absolutely destroy even more. What worries me most is actually that really the, the lives of Ukrainians are just taken as a, as a casualty, as something not even worth speaking about. They don't as... even talk about it. The no. leadership no. is absolutely gross. You know, I look, I, I'm sure that uh, Zelensky is in a very hard place, but all he talks about right now is throwing more lives to the graves. Frankly, no strategy, no self-awareness, no situational awareness. Okay, it's very sad because the United States talked him out of a peace agreement in March 2022. That was Zelensky's chance, and he lost it. He was inexperienced. You know, when you the United States comes and tells you, we have your back. You, you know, you tend to believe it if you're inexperienced. I tried to tell them, by the way, I, you know, I, I really tried to tell the Ukrainians, look, I'm, a, I'm an old guy. I've been through lots of U.S. wars, Vietnam War, Nicaragua, uh, the Gulf Wars, uh, Syria. They never win. Are you kidding? Do you really want to end up like Afghanistan? And oh. they didn't believe me. They just thought, oh, you're a Putin apologist. Uh, so they didn't want to hear any of this. But I was telling them the hard facts about American wars, and they didn't want to hear it. Uh, besides Russia, uh, I'm not sure that Ukraine actually is such a big topic uh, in uh, in American uh, policy. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, um, it's, it's maybe, maybe definitely the minute. You know, it's a big focus of the political class still the military industrial complex and the White House. Maybe for just political reasons that uh, Biden doesn't want to admit what a lousy poker player he is. But the, the point is, uh, for the American people, they've had enough. There's no groundswell of support. People don't want that. They want to stop this thing. And so in that sense, you're absolutely right. Typically, the public doesn't have much say in this. We have almost no public debate, but Biden's popularity is really collapsing. And if the uh, unhappiness with Biden's foreign policy is very, very clear. So maybe even public opinion 
is going to start playing a role because we're now in an election year. Um, I would uh, like to ask you to clear the position on China, because when I look both at the Republicans or at the Democrats, I would say that their views on China are very similar. So they actually have very hostile views uh, towards China. Uh, now there was a summit, uh, APEC, where uh, both presidents, Biden and Xi Jinping, met. Um, do you see any, any decline in tension, any hopes that actually the relations, they are probably not going to be friendly, but let's say at least stabilize and, and would be less, less threatening for the world? I'll tell you an interesting thing. When uh, President Xi came to this APEC summit in San Francisco, he met uh, 200 U.S. business leaders and they gave him a standing ovation. I don't think they would give an American president a standing ovation, but they gave President Xi a standing ovation. Why? China's their biggest market. They both produce in China, they sell in China, they make a lot of money in China, and they want normal relations. What, what is happening is two things. One, we have a kind of security class in America who uh, are all about uh, American dominance, American hegemony, America being number one. It's a very strange group of people, uh, but this is uh, our foreign policy establishment. Then we have politicians who basically uh, think that, and it's very particular, uh, Trump in 2016 won the election by winning swing states in the middle of America, in the American Midwest, which is our industrial zone. And he won it by saying, China took your jobs away. Mm -hmm. And when he made narrow victories in those states, the Democrats said, oh, we have to attack China in order to compete politically with Trump. So there are two reasons for the anti-China sentiment in the United States. One, and in the political class, one is this idea of America being the only dominant country. Well, I mean, you know, you know, unless you're playing a board game like the game of risk, you don't get to be the dominant country in the world when there are other big countries around. So this is arrogance, again, very misguided. Then there is this protectionist politics. Uh, which uh, tries to appeal to a few swing states in the U.S. elections. The upshot of this is that the political class, both Democrats and Republicans, are pretty united against China, pretty ignorant from my experience. They don't know China. Oh. They don't know Chinese history. They don't have any perspective. They play a dangerous game like when uh, our Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi flew to Taiwan. Mm. So stupid. Sorry. Just why do you want to provoke another thank superpower? You, thank you for saying that. Because no, we so have the same stupid. representatives who are also provoking China yeah. in this in this country. No. Okay, don't provoke China. Be respectful. Just have normal relations. Don't provoke a superpower. Why? What is in it to poke a superpower? It's stupid. People should think, you know, if there's some, even if you think there's a bully, which China's not, but if you think there's a bully in the schoolyard and you're, a, you know, a little kid and you think they're the bully, is it really smart to go poking them and say, you're a bully, I hate you? No, you're going to get hurt in the end. So you need some common sense. And China's not even bullying. China is just big, successful, dynamic, actually a good trade partner for Europe. So we should treat it normally, respectfully. And uh, the U.S. anxieties should not be Europe's anxieties. This is another area where European politicians mm -hmm. are just repeating the words of American politicians. And you know, I know behind the scenes, it's although it's obvious, you know, why does Vanderlyn repeat words almost like Biden? 
because she feels that her job is to be with the United States. Maybe she hopes the United States appoints her as the Secretary General of NATO or something. I don't know oh, what goodness. it is. No, but that's what, what she hopes maybe. So oh. this is where Europe makes a big mistake, just like it did make a big mistake in Ukraine. It would make a big mistake of trying to make an enemy out of China. That's a completely ridiculous losing proposition. Uh, my last question, because time, our time is coming up, I have to reflect one very current event you already mentioned, and that's uh, the elections in Argentina. Yes. Because let's say that uh, the elected president is an unusual personality. Um, how, how do you view this situation? Um, is there a danger for, for BRICS or, or maybe for other Latin American countries with his very strange suggestions as for foreign policy, as for economics. Yeah, of course, time will tell. One thing is uh, he won the presidency, but has uh, no uh, control over the Congress. Uh, his small parties, and at least for the moment, doesn't have any kind of governing coalition in the Congress. So maybe his uh, ability to uh, do things will require a much broader coalition of forces, and that could be a, a constraint. But let me just say first, Argentina is a country that has been unstable for its whole history, going back to the 1820s, ever since independence. Argentina has messed up more currencies, had more inflation, and more instability than any other place on the entire planet. This guy won not because of what he says, but because of disgust with the outgoing government, which was delivering inflation of triple digits, uh, more than 100%. You can't really win an election when inflation is a uh, triple digit. And I know Argentina quite well uh, and actually worked with the finance minister just before this one. And he ended up, he was doing a good job and he ended up being not forced out. He resigned, unfortunately, uh, but he resigned because his own, I would say, corrupt politicians in his own party were uh, rejecting the normal policies that he was trying to promote. So Argentina is now in yet another cycle of instability. Uh, all my professional career as an economist, I've been watching Argentina in amazement because it's it's not an impoverished country by any means. And it's you know got huge natural wealth and, uh, and very smart people, um, well-educated uh, class of people. But it has made such a political mess repeatedly. And this could be yet another one. I don't want to say on the first day after the election of uh, this guy that he'll really govern the way he campaigned because sometimes they become a lot more responsible. But it could be that, he's, <laughs> that he is what he says he is, in which case uh, Argentina is going to face some real troubles. I don't I, it, it's regrettable because I'm I'm a a fan of the BRICS. I would like to see them work. Argentina is a new member of the BRICS group. Uh, whether this guy stays in or out of the BRICS or gets kicked out of the BRICS, everything remains to be seen. Uh, but I uh, I only hope that this guy was making this as a persona, not as a real politics, because uh, his real politics, uh, if delivered this way, would be very, very detrimental to Argentina. ...office in 2021, rather than trying to de-escalate, he called for NATO enlargement and reinforced the U.S. push to expand eastward. Putin strongly pushed back. Biden pushed back. The U.S. signed several 
statements in 2021 confirming that NATO would enlarge. I think this was all absolutely irresponsible. Russia masked troops on its border and put on the table a draft U.S.-Russia security agreement on December 17th, 2021, based on no NATO enlargement. The Biden administration formally replied that it was not willing to negotiate over that issue in a response in January. Then Russia invaded on February 24th, 2022, making clear that it was the failure to reach an understanding on the NATO question that was central to Russia's action. Four weeks later, Zelensky declared that Ukraine was accepting of neutrality. In other words, the initial Russian invasion brought Ukraine to the negotiating table. And during the second half of March, with the Turkish government being the mediators, Russia and Ukraine hammered out a peace agreement. Incredibly, the United States blocked it because the United States told the Ukrainian government, you fight on because American policymakers had two ideas. One was that Ukraine should not be neutral. It should be a NATO country. And second, that the war would be won by some combination of Western armaments and financial sanctions. And so the U.S. ratcheted up the war. Putin said, no, we don't stand down. We fight and mobilized hundreds of thousands of Russians in the summer of 2022. And since then, we've been on a path of military escalation. I resent the fact as a citizen threatened by this, that Biden has not negotiated over NATO and that Biden and Putin have not talked once, as far as we know, since February 24th, 2022. You know, when two sides are fighting, they need to talk and negotiate. But that's rejected. The hardliners in the United States, Newland, Blinken, Sullivan, Biden, say, why negotiate? We just escalate. We'll defeat Russia. This is, in my view, utterly reckless and irresponsible. First, it leads to the destruction of Ukraine. And second, it risks the escalation to nuclear war. So I'm very unhappy about this, and I very much resent that the mainstream media, like the New York Times, repeats the falsehood all the time that this was an unprovoked action on February 24th, 2022, seemingly wanting us to be without any context or history to understand where this conflict came from and how it can end. And a newspaper like the New York Times has a responsibility to tell the truth, and they're not doing it. Indeed. As citizens, we have the right, you know, a country is not looking after in the U.S. the prosperity of its own citizens going out, conducting these irresponsible wars when we don't have time with other things with the environment. Ironically, what seems to be behind it all is this insistence on a unipolar world, insistence on dominance. And while the U.S. wants to hold on to its status as a reserve currency, it seems under those economic sanctions that U.S. has also suffered, it might even be hastening, strengthening strengthening the currencies of other countries? Well, the basic point is the U.S. has 4.1% of the world population. So how could it presume to be the world leader? You know, the U.S. is a powerful country. It's a rich country, but it doesn't run the world and it should not aspire to run the world. That's a kind of madness. And the U.S. ideology for a long time has been that the U.S. should run the world. It's to my mind, unbelievable. But then again, I've spent most of my career outside the U.S. seeing the other 95.9% .9 of the world. And I know that the other 95% of the world doesn't want the United States to run the world. It's not against the United States. It just says, let us have our own part of the world. We don't want you running the world. We don't want you deciding what our government is, who we are, how we rule ourselves. 
you know, you're just one place. And this, the United States leaders don't understand. They're very arrogant. They're very ignorant because of the two big oceans. They're very unaware of the history of other parts of the world. And we end up with this arrogant and naive and dangerous foreign policy because there's no doubt the United States is rich and powerful and it makes lots of weapon systems. And I'm 68 years old and the United States has been at war almost every year of my life from Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia and Nicaragua and Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and Libya and now Ukraine. Come on, give it a break. And the U.S. is also experiencing the reality that other places in the world are catching up on technology, indeed leading on technologies as well. And China's a very successful, very industrious, very hardworking society, which in the last 40 years has gone from poverty to a very significant world important economy. And the U.S. has a very hard time accepting that. The U.S. attitude, if you listen to congressmen who don't seem to know anything, is, oh, if China's successful, it must be because they're cheating. What about because they're saving more than 40% of GDP that the Chinese people have been engaging in a remarkable upgrading of education? Hundreds of thousands of PhDs minted each year. Massive scientific research programs. Come on, this is the truth. And so this arrogance is not allowing the truth to come through. But you mentioned one specific point, which is the role of the U.S. dollar, part of the U.S. strength after World War II is, well, the U.S. was basically the only economy standing, and it was a technologically advanced, rich, large economy, the world's largest. And the dollar was really the only internationally usable currency for quite a long time. So the dollar system became the center of how you do international trade. When you trade in goods, they're denominated in dollars. When you buy the imports, you pay in dollars, meaning you use accounts in U.S. dollars, typically in the U.S. banking system. When the transaction is closed, it's closed through the so-called SWIFT interbank system. And so the U.S. has had a what France long ago called an exorbitant privilege that it could print a lot of money because the rest of the world was holding dollars, using dollars. The dollar was the basis of the world economy. That's changing now. And it's changing for three basic reasons. One is the share of the U.S. in the world economy is diminishing. So this means that the predominance of the U.S. is bound to diminish. The second is technologically settlements are going to occur in all sorts of ways other than through U.S. banks and so-called digital currencies, especially central bank digital currencies, will mean other ways to make settlements. We'll settle in renminbi when we buy in China or settle in rubles or settle in rupees when trade is with India and so forth. So there will be multiple currencies. And then the third part, which is really a matter of a bad set of decision making, the U.S. has militarized the dollar, meaning that usually you think about money, well, you have it, you can use it, you can spend it. But the United States has come to say, if we don't like you, you don't necessarily have access to your money anymore if it's in our banks. So the U.S. froze the the dollar holdings of Russia. The U.S. has frozen the dollar holdings of Venezuela. The U.S. froze the dollar holdings of Afghanistan. My advice to any government that's not getting along with the U.S. government is be careful about your money because the U.S. might come in and freeze your money. And so countries are looking to hold their reserves in other ways now. Perfectly understandable. And I think that this is another part of the move to a multi-currency international system from a dollar-based international system. And you mentioned the possibility of a reserve currency being the renminbi. And so there's other things that are not often reported about China. One, and I know that you've written about this as well, is that they're stepping in where America's policy of destabilizing and it's destructive, 
China, in some cases in the Middle East, is stepping in as a peacemaker, and it's less expensive if we can achieve peace. Well, probably the most remarkable diplomatic achievement of recent years, I would say, is China brokering a peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. In the American idea, those two countries were implacable foes. They could never agree. And for the United States, Iran was the enemy and Saudi Arabia was the ally. But the whole idea of U.S. foreign policy is you bring countries under your authority as an ally of the United States, like Saudi Arabia, and you fight your enemies on the other side. But China has a different idea, which is that Saudi Arabia and Iran had no fundamental reasons for this dissension, but they have plenty of reasons for cooperation. For one thing, they're both being hard hit by climate change. They need to cooperate because the water crisis is quite severe. They're both hydrocarbon economies. They need an energy transformation, which is very profound. And so the Chinese facilitated a reconciliation between the two. I'm very happy about that reconciliation, by the way. The fighting between the bitterness between between Iran and Saudi Arabia divided Western Asia. It contributed to an absolutely devastating war in Yemen, in which the United States gave its military support that killed a lot of people. And uh, it destabilized a region that needs a lot of economic transformation and technological upgrading and change. And so this agreement is really a big help for the whole region, not only for the two countries involved. And China gets a lot of credit, in my view, for having the wisdom to see that that was a conflict that could be solved, not just exacerbated, but the U.S. approach was always to push at it. Uh, even when the U.S. made an agreement with Iran, the, the nuclear agreement called the JCPOA, the U.S. government walked away from it. And then it maintained sanctions on Iran because the U.S. is not really serious at making peace most of the time. It's got an us versus them mentality, and I find that very destructive and not in the U.S. interest. Yes, and I hope that China maintains this sensible approach because it's dangerous what's happening now in Taiwan. And just help us understand the situation like and that through line between you know, these proxy wars and what could happen in China. Well, the situation in Taiwan is like the situation in Ukraine very explosive, very dangerous, and requires cool heads to avoid a conflict. The fact of the matter is that actually all three governments, let me say the United States, uh, Taiwan, and China have a policy that there's one China. And whether it is the government in Taiwan or the government in Beijing, they both say there's one China. They disagree on what happened in 1949 and how China should be governed, but they don't say there are two countries. And the United States, when it established diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China, very clearly said that there is one China and has one China policy. And that is how to keep peace and uh, to make sure that this tension between Beijing and Taipei does not boil over to open conflict. But the United States started to play games with this. It started to form a military alliance with Taiwan, in effect, which is really coming into a military alliance in the middle of one country. And this is an extremely dangerous and imprudent thing to do. And Biden starts talking about how we're going to defend Taiwan. And the American politicians talk about how a war is coming. It's all utterly reckless, irresponsible. And what we should have is trying to reduce tensions, diffuse tensions through negotiation, through talk, through peace building ideas, rather than stoking the idea that some conflict is inevitable. A conflict would be devastating, of course, first and foremost for Taiwan, but actually for the whole world. And so this needs to be avoided and we need cool heads and we shouldn't have American politicians saber rattling. We should not have Speaker Nancy Pelosi fly to Taiwan after the Chinese government has repeatedly said, don't do that. 
don't provoke, don't stir up things, don't make conflicts where there don't have to be conflicts. But the United States leadership doesn't listen very well. It's the same thing that when Putin said many, many, many times, do not expand NATO to Ukraine. The United States, I'm oh, sorry, we don't hear you. It's, you have nothing to say about that. That's none of your business. And then war comes. This is very typical of American foreign policy because American foreign policy leaders are too arrogant and they don't listen. Yes. And now, 61 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis, you'd think we learned our lesson. And of course, America would never accept a military alliance on its doorstep, you know, say coming down from Canada or something like that. Well, of course, when Cuba aligned with the Soviet Union in 1960, the U.S. idea was invade. That's it. It didn't say, oh, Mr. Castro, you could do what you want. It's an open door. If you want to be with Soviet Union, that's fine with us. No, it said, well, we we invade. So that was 1961. In 1962, in the repercussions of that and in a really reckless gamble and reckless action by the Soviet Union putting missiles into Cuba, this whole conflict escalated to just the brink of nuclear war and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then in 1963, both President Kennedy and Soviet Chairman Nikita Khrushchev said, you know, we have to pull back from the brink. We have to live together. We should not be coming to the edge of global nuclear war. And they signed the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in the summer of 1963, proving that even at the height of the Cold War, if the mindset is right, you can make peace. And that's the mindset that we need now. Yes, it seems like the neocon mindset never really went away. You know, just help us understand, because to my mind, you know, Ukraine is not indispensable for the U.S., right? It's just this idea of NATO enlargement. But there's other forces behind the scenes that are, you know, profiting or pushing. And I understand that Zelensky, you know, secured $110 billion in U.S. aid and of course, humanitarian, financial, military support, also like key partnerships with, you know, the BlackRock venture capital firm, Goldman Sachs, to privatize Ukrainian assets. So that would then deepen the country's debt. So help us understand that a little, the path forward. How do we get out of this? Well, when the debate raged initially in the 1990s about the wisdom or lack of wisdom of NATO enlargement, which was contrary to what we had promised and was not wise. A lobbying campaign took place in the United States led by the military industrial complex. Very crude. That's how American politics works. Bring out the big bucks. So it was Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and other big companies became the lobbyists. And then, you know, American congressmen, they salute money. They salute campaign contributions. They salute the lobbyists. And so this is how American politics works. There are always financial interests that are also playing a role here. So we have a mix of ideology, confusion, lack of historical sense, arrogance, and money all stirring the pot. It has very little to do with the American people, though. The American people are not asked about anything. The votes on money for Ukraine are generally almost secret because they're not really debated. They're just measures stuck into some other piece of legislation so that you never have to debate the fact that we've spent more than a hundred ten billion dollars so far on Ukraine and nobody's really been asked about it. Nothing of the American people haven't really been asked. So this is how American politics works. Now, what should be done? This war should end by the United States saying that NATO will not enlarge and Russia saying we take our troops home. That's the core of this. That was available in December 2021. It was available in March 2022, and it's still available now. It doesn't solve many, many other issues. What happens to the territories? What happens to Crimea? These are for negotiations. But the basic idea is that the two superpowers back off and that the war stops and that we go to political solutions, not military solutions. And that should be our priority. And so finally, as you think about the future, uh, the prospect of nuclear war, the kind of world that we're leaving the next generation, what would you like young people to know, preserve, and remember? 
young people should lead the way to a safer, cooperative, peaceful, and environmentally sustainable and fair world. This is the point. We need to build the future we want, not to feel trapped in this mindless cycle of violence and environmental destruction. The problems that we face are solvable, and they are not driven by the needs of the people. They're driven by greed or power-seeking of elites. And we need to have a new generation say, this is not working. We want a world that is at peace, that is shared in prosperity, and that solves the environmental crises, which have become so deep and are neglected in part because we are wasting our time, our lives, our resources on these useless wars. No, let me say it's the first book of Western political science is the better way to say it, because Plato had written The Republic a generation earlier. But it's the first book of political science. It is paired with his ethics, Nicomachean ethics, as two joined volumes, because for Aristotle, ethics and politics were the same. Of course, in 15... 14, I think it is, Machiavelli wrote a very different political science. He wrote a handbook for the prince, which was about how to maintain power. And political science in the West began to be the science of maintaining or managing power, not the science of producing the good. And in fact, Machiavelli was teaching the prince. He was actually making a job application back to the Medicis because he had been dismissed from the Medicis, wanting a job back that he was advising the Medicis how to hold power in Florence. Later in the next century, one of the most influential texts in Western cultural history was written by Thomas Hobbes, the Leviathan. And this was written in 1640 as Western science was taking shape. And Hobbes wanted a scientific theory of human beings, but modeled as individual atoms that collide with each other. Because for Hobbes, there was no longer a cultivation of virtue, but rather each individual with insatiable desires. So Hobbes's model of human nature is that it is simply unbounded desire. It can't be taught to moderate desire. It can't be cultivated for virtue. It is individualistic and it is insatiable. And so Hobbes said, unless there is an overarching power, people will kill each other. And so we need a Leviathan, he said, to stop human nature from committing non-stop violence. It was a very pessimistic view of human nature, but notice the main point is no longer was there any idea of developing virtue. That was deemed to be impossible. Instead, one needed institutions to reflect harsh reality. This is the flip of philosophy. It's no longer about cultivating the good. It is about controlling the bad. Then interestingly and importantly, this was amplified at the beginning of the 18th century, first by a very uh, influential public intellectual, Bernard Mandeville, who wrote an essay in London called The Fable of the Bees. And in The Fable of the Bees, the most aggressive bees win, but they make the hive powerful and great. And if you try to control the avarice or the vice or the aggression of the bees, the hive actually dies. So this was now a philosophy of empire, that power-seeking was good because it would make the society
powerful and wealthy and able to dominate over the other bees. So it was taking Hobbes and adding another element. One beehive taking dominance over others. And clearly this was a philosophy that appealed to the emerging British Empire. Then came Adam Smith six decades later in 1776. And he said, in agreement with Hobbes and in agreement with Mandeville, that human nature is individualistic, tastes are unbounded, desire is a great motivator, but market forces will tame all of that because market forces will force a kind of competition that will lead to a socially beneficent outcome. The point is the Anglo-Saxon philosophy broke free of more than 1,800 years of Western tradition. The Western tradition from Aristotle and Christianity was a tradition of the common good, virtue, and care for the poor. By the, with the rise of the British Empire, the philosophy came, became the benefits of power as a philosophy. And then even the idea that this would lead to, quote, the common good. But there are two more steps that are important to state. The poor became an enemy because now they were a drag on society. So John Locke, one of our most esteemed philosophers, wanted very harsh treatment for the poor so that they would not be burdens on society. And then came Malthus. Thomas Malthus wrote after Adam Smith one generation later in 1798. And he proposed something even darker, which is that those hives, those different societies, are actually in competition for survival with each other because there are more people produced than can be supported. And so life is a battle for survival. And trying to help the poor is inevitably to fail, because there will just be more poor people. That was his iron law of population. And it's, that led in the next step. Darwin took that idea brilliantly from a scientific point of view to understand natural selection. But the later 19th century philosophers took that idea as a struggle across nations. And that now nations or peoples or races were in the struggle for survival. And this became known as social Darwinism. And the idea was not only should there be no beneficence, if you help your own poor, you will weaken your society compared to others. And indeed, you're in a struggle for survival. And this gave rise to the worst crimes of history. Because Nazism actually is a philosophy, which it was, was based on social Darwinist pseudoscience. And this idea, the German people will survive or the Slavic people will survive. And so this is a war even to extermination. Now this kind of idea led to the worst cruelties, but we are still in a mindset in the Western world where it is competition and struggle that is the absolute underpinning of society. When I studied economics, I was taught about perfect competition. I was never taught even one minute about perfect cooperation. The idea doesn't even exist in economics. It's not even developed in one paper that I know of. 
because the idea of cooperation as a norm doesn't exist. It happened, this notion of letting greed motivate action perhaps did generate the spirit of innovation to some extent. But the way that it was championed and taught, of course, led to the worst excesses. So the world became rich, and those who were rich became devoid of benevolence and compassion. And a terrible writer in the United States who became quite popular, Ayn Rand, a kind of uh, popular philosopher among young people and among many politicians, wrote a famous essay about the virtues of selfishness. So selfishness became the virtue, actually. That's the literal title of an essay. It's unbelievable, and she is championed by many still. These novels are unbearable to read, but they are part of our philosophy. So I went on too long, I know, because the sign told me to stop five minutes ago. But, so that's not very benevolent of me. But let me say the following. I believe we've had a deviation from the right path in Western civilization. There are roots of Western culture that we can really use to find a path of virtue and politics that is ethical. But the Anglo-Saxon version deeply lost this tradition. And there are many fascinating reasons for this, but it was mainly the rise of power of the British Empire which was in many ways an extremely nasty empire. And the United States learned everything it knows from the British Empire because it aims to be the continuation of the British Empire after World War II. And this is what needs to end, a world that can return to the common ethical principles of virtue. Now, let me just conclude by saying I am hopeful that this can actually happen. And I think you at the table need to help lead that. And we need to help explain these things. And when President Xi Jinping launched last year the Global Civilizations Initiative, I think that this is actually an important opening that is very positive because China has said we should go back to our roots of culture to find a way forward, which I very much subscribe to. And the GCI, or Global Civilizations Initiative, is an invitation across civilizational wisdom. And I hosted a meeting in Athens last month, co-hosted, with the Academy of Athens, a Aristotle-Confucius symposium on ancient wisdom for modern challenges that brought together Chinese and Western philosophers. We didn't have Buddha properly at the table except one very distinguished Buddhist thinker from Cambodia, but we need more of that. At the end of this meeting, we agreed that we would have a second symposium. This time, I hope it is the Aristotle Buddha Confucius Symposium in Shufu, uh, in Shandong province in July. I hope we could participate together in that. Uh, we will be back for that. Many philosophers are interested in that. I will be in Shufu in next month. Uh, for the Nishan uh, Forum, which is uh, also a philosophical forum, but the 
Shandong government has asked to host the follow-up meeting of the Aristotle, Buddha, Confucius uh, symposium. And I believe that this idea of East and West deep philosophical traditions, finding the deep humanity that is common across them is extremely important and powerful and can really contribute to an understanding which right now doesn't exist. And I think the failings of this understanding are overwhelmingly on the Western side, if I may say so, because we are steeped in a philosophy of competition and even war. And this mindset is taken as given, but it is actually a recent phenomenon. It is an imperial phenomenon and it needs to be put aside. So I, I believe that this actually can be done. Can I have two more minutes? <laughs> because I want to talk about net zero by 2050. And first to say how much I admire what Dr. Shaw proposed and uh, I, is the book in English also, or in Chinese? Okay, we're going to have to get me an English translation somehow, uh, if we can. <laughs> but I'm very eager also to read your forthcoming paper. Let me add a couple of things that I think are central, but I think they're already exactly in your uh, climate club idea. It is not possible to reach net zero one country at a time, least of all for an island. We need an interconnected energy system, region by region, because if you are tapping renewable energy, it's intermittent. So it's sunny here or windy here. This needs interconnection. And East Asia should be interconnected in a common grid. There is a mainland China program called GuideCo. Government cooperation organization that is the China state grid engineers who are doing analytical work on interconnecting regional grids for Africa, for South America, for North America, for Europe, and for Asia. This is very important work. Taiwan should be connected to the mainland in a power grid. And the mainland should be connected with Mongolia, and it should be connected with the ASEAN countries. and. with submarine system. It would be region, the economic powerhouse of the world, rather than a battleground, because this region has everything if it works together. And it could lose everything if it views the region as a battleground. I think everyone in this region can understand this. The only one that does not is my country, actually. But the US needs to be told, let us solve our problems. We know how to discuss. Don't meddle because you will make a mess. This is actually the truth. This is true about Japan. It's true.
of zero carbon energy and all the cooperation that go would the regional cooperation, the regional structure, and pose and probably roadmaps that show the physical interconnectedness, what technologies, where, as I've been saying, of a plan. It's 80% fossil fuel. What plan is that? Nothing. Please, <laughs> don't encourage them. So, show fantastic or work. I was, Sonia and I were just in Beijing with them a couple of days ago. We'll come back for a meeting that they're hosting on September 26th uh, for a worldwide meeting on energy interconnections. I think that this is really uh, uh, ab absolutely at the core. So I agree with everything that you said, and I think that it's absolutely the way forward, and in that polycentric world, there's a concept which I find very useful. It's a concept adopted by the European Union, but a concept that actually started with the Roman Catholic Church, and that is the concept of subsidiarity, which is that we need governance at all levels. So we need global governance, regional governance, national governance, local governance, you put each problem at the lowest level possible, closest to the people, where it can be solved, but not below the level at which it can be solved. So the power grid cannot be solved at the national level. It must be solved at the regional level. The targets for decarbonization must be solved at the global level, and so forth. And the idea of subsidiarity is that we have this multiple levels. We have global governance. We have a global government that can do certain things and not other things. We have regional government. We have national government. We have local 